la gestión sanitaria en acuicultura. Para hacer sostenible o una herramienta de sostenibilidad de, de la acuicultura es la, la gestión sanitaria. Si nuestra producción está sana, nuestros animales rendirán y, por tanto, harán sostenible desde el punto de vista económico, pero también medioambiental, porque reduciremos el uso de, de antibióticos o de otros eh, biocidas necesarios para mantener la, la producción. También es importante que las producciones animales normalmente están confinadas, están muy controladas, sin embargo, las granjas marinas están en contacto directo con el medio ambiente. No podemos hacer otra cosa que nos beneficiamos del medio ambiente, pero no podemos hacer otra cosa eh, para aislarnos. Entonces, la gestión sanitaria es bastante diferente de, de la que es un, una producción intensiva en el medio ambiente. En otras ganaderías, cuando se hace en el medio ambiente, en abierto, ¿no? pues son ganaderías extensivas. Aquí estamos haciendo una ganadería intensiva, pero en contacto con el medio ambiente, sin poder controlar el medio ambiente. Así que hoy contaremos con, con tres ponentes especializadas en gestión sanitaria en granjas marinas que nos van a, a ilustrar sobre este tema. En primer lugar, contamos con Slavica Kolak, eh, ella viene de, de Cromaris, eh, donde es jefe de jefe veterinario jefe de, de esta empresa, que es una empresa que se dedica a la producción acuícola eh, de lubina, lubina, chivas, lubina y, y, y dorada. Eh, ella es veterinaria, es doctora en veterinaria también por, por la Universidad de Zagreb y ha, antes de ocupar este, este puesto pues ha, ha pasado por varias empresas de acuicultura con lo cual conoce bien de los diferentes problemas en las distintas granjas y, por tanto, pues tiene una experiencia, la verdad, que muy valiosa. Así que yo no cuento más que ella, ella nos, nos ilustre. Así que, primera ponente. me and for inviting me to this conference. It's an uh, honor to be here and to present to you um, my presentation, uh, Health Management in Croatian Aquaculture. Croatian Aquaculture is um, something which is growing in the last 10 years and it's a steady growth rate of 70% in the last 10 years. Uh, most of the production is in the sea and brackish water, and only 28% is in the fresh water. So also its um, <coughs> technology is um, for the sea water and the brackish. So we have 67% of the farms which are in the floating phase, and it's, uh, most of them are related to the uh, sea and only 25 in the ponds, uh, which is entirely farmed in fresh water. In the mariculture, you can see in the picture, uh, the farms are dispersed uh, on all the coast counties, but uh, most of them are in the middle of the Adriatic coast in the Zadar County. I'm coming from Zadar County, it's a two reasons. For that, uh, the minor reason is that uh, mariculture starts uh, in that county, so we have a history and tradition of farming. It starts in 1979 in the Tenmar company. And the uh, second reason is that uh, this county has uh, integrated coastal zone management. So we have zones in the coast which are allocated only for the aquaculture. And it's the reason why we have a little bit more farms and better growth than in other counties. In the other counties, we have lots of um, um, uh, ever lots with uh, tourism and other activities. <coughs> so we cannot grow fast as in these other counties. As the mariculture is very young discipline when we compare it with the other animals, we also have a very big difference between the companies and the size of the companies. So we know that only fish, which is healthy, can give us a 
good results, but only the big companies have a veterinarian as an employer. Uh, small companies don't have uh, veterinarians and they usually have other services. In big companies, health protection, protection is implemented through measures like uh, biosecurity, vaccination, monitoring, environmental control, feed quality and quantity control, and other measures. And all the monitoring is done uh, according to the annual plans, uh, which correspond with the plan of sending samples to the analysis. As I told you, in small companies, the health protection is um, on the low level, and they are usually depending on the support which is coming from the feed, uh, fish feed supplier. Usually that uh, people are giving them advices about the uh, health. Uh, methods in the healthcare is uh, very wide and it's also um, approach which is appropriate for the new discipline. So uh, there is a uh, lots of new things and unknown uh, things in mariculture. So we need to get a very wide range of the clinical examination. Uh, it's the best way is to check all the farms each week, each stage is also each week, but sometimes it's not possible. So we are also depending on the recording of the losses uh, of the technicians which are working on the farms. So we have protocols that they are sending us daily information about the feed, on the mortality rate, on the change of the behavior of the fish to be very accurate in the treatment. Um, also. As a veterinarian on the farm, uh, there is a um, big need to know much more about the nutritional needs of the fish than any other veterinarian discipline, because um, feed for the fish is also quite new thing. And it uh, has a big differences between the species. So you need to be very accurate in this uh, knowledge and to follow everything which is uh, now changing in the fish feed. When I start, fish feed was mainly based on the fish meal and fish oil, and now the fish feed is uh, quite different. With a minimal fish meal and minimum of fish oil to be sustainable, but it can be something that uh, will jeopardize the health of your animal if you don't uh, take attention about that. Also, we need to control uh, zoo hygiene, environment, and all the farming techniques. And to be involved in the techniques which uh, need to be improved or to change. Because uh, when this um, mariculture started in Croatia, it was um, quite uh, based on the uh, situation that one farmers had all the generation on one site. And these sites uh, were very protected, very shallow water. And in the years, uh, they find out that this is the worst way to farm fish. Now it's a big uh, problem how to change this location because we don't have, in the government, we don't have any uh, way to change the location which are already made for mariculture. So now the big farms uh, are trying to segregate the generation because we know that it's um, uh, better to have uh, segregated generation because the smaller fish had um, not um, very good uh, immunolog Im immune system. So when they are living with the older fish, they are prone to the old pathogens which are already on the older farms. Also, it's a big um, deal when you are following the parasitical disease because the young one easily come uh, <coughs> receive the parasite from the older one. The major diseases which are occurring in Croatia are categorized by positive agents as bacteria, parasitical, nutritional. Uh, usually in the big farms, uh, they uh, 
put for the, all the losses daily, they, what is the um, cause of the losses. So they can analyze the causes uh, after one year to see what is happening and what is the major cause of uh, losses. This uh, was situation before we start uh, to do vaccination of bacterial, uh, bacterial diseases. So the first and biggest losses were caused by bacterial diseases. Uh, main bacterial pathogens uh, were Vibrio Harvey, Listonella anguillarum, Vibrio anguillarum, and it was very difficult to distinguish uh, when the disease is um, caused by the problem in technology, like uh, bad zoo hygiene or bad uh, feed, bad feeding protocol, always the primary cause of the disease. Uh, also, the some losses uh, were caused by Tenantibaculum maritimum and Photobacterium damcella species specifica, but the losses were a little bit lower. So uh, these diseases can be treated with uh, antibiotics, but uh, with the growth of mariculture, there is a big need to do something to reduce the use of antibiotics for the fish especially because of these animals are um, maintained for the feed. So we need to be very careful when we are uh, giving them a treatment. Um, because of this, uh, we decide in company to uh, make a strategy how to reduce the antibiotic um, use and how to prevent diseases which are causing bacterial problems. So we decided to start with vaccination. It was uh, uh, vaccination, but only in the hatcheries, and it was um, for the very short uh, duration. So uh, vaccination process, we uh, suppose that it will be preventive measures, but also that it will be uh, greatly contribute to the health, survival, and growth of fish. Uh, this increases um, uh, the economic efficiency of the production, reduces the cost of the treatment, and other costs which are related to food production, disposal of dead fish, and etc. Uh, cost of vaccination is um, quite high, so we made uh, some protocols how to control if the um, vaccination is justifying the cost which we are doing. Generally, we are doing in the two ways. So small farms are using only immersion uh, vaccination, which is done in the hatchery. They buy uh, the fry, which is already vaccinated by immersion. It's uh, easy to done, but also it's um, a very short uh, period in which fish is protected by immersion. It's only four to six uh, months. Uh, one of the things is that uh, we need to make uh, immersion when fish is very small, so the immune system is not uh, developed for the vaccination. But uh, in Croatia, the fish from hatchery to sea is going with the three grams, so we need to do it uh, very, very early in the hatchery. And the uh, other method is the intraperitoneal method, which is um, better. Um, this method is uh, most uh, efficient, uh, effective uh, vaccination method uh, from two points, from points of the quality of the protection and the duration of disease resistance. So when we have this kind of the vaccination, we can use immersion in hatchery, and then after four to six months, sometimes even more, we are using uh, intraperitoneal injection. Uh, again, in the small farms, uh, they sometimes do the vaccination, but they doing uh, with the immersion. Again, with an immersion in the uh, sea. The job is um, uh, very hard, so it's not something that is uh, sustainable.
uh, when we start to make a vaccination and to analyze um, benefits of vaccination, one of the things were also time when we can do the vaccination. We have in Croatia uh, cold, uh, colder sea periods uh, than uh, you in the Spain, and we have from the May to October optimum temperatures for making a vaccination because for the sea bus the optimum is uh, from 18 to 22 and this is period which is uh, too short to uh, make uh, all uh, population vaccinated so we are uh, obliged to do it also in the colder period of year which is not I think uh, the case in Spain so to do it because it's not something that is um, in the recipes of the producer, we were obliged to make some analysis uh, and we were making uh, the control of uh, uh, specific antibodies after vaccination on the temperatures of 16 and 14 because last year we finished uh, with, with vaccination before Christmas and temperature of the sea was in that time 15. So we took uh, two cases. One uh, were vaccinated on this cold uh, temperature and other was uh, controlled just to see do we have it effects of this uh, vaccination on the cold uh, sea. Uh, the red one is uh, vaccinated case and the blue one is unvaccinated. So now we have results not only from these two cages, but uh, for a group of uh, 10 cages, results that we have some uh, response of um, uh, antibody uh, after vaccination. They are not so high, they are low, and it's uh, individual. So we know that vaccination on the low temperature could be performed, but uh, that we cannot expect that uh, effects of the vaccination will be after 500 days, similar like in the warm period. We made it also for the warm period and uh, a specific antibody titer was much higher than on the cold water. But uh, luckily we didn't have any mortality and any outbreaks of um, Vibrio angularum, so uh, we will continue to do in this protocol. When we start to work uh, this vaccine, we had in Croatia only one uh, vaccine. Now we are having two commercial bivalent vaccine which we can use uh, to in vaccination and one of the things that uh, you need to control in the management of the health is also control of the supplier it's um, when you are doing control of supplier you are trying to do it on the most objective way not to be in the conflict with the supplier but uh, on the other hand to have some information is there any difference between the vaccine so we did um, the trial uh, with the two vaccine and this is the result. So we can see after 500 days that uh, we have a good response of antibody titer in um, both commercial vaccine. But uh, the first one have a little better result. We will follow up these cages to see the performance of the fish because we choose the same origin same uh, size of the fish and we will follow them up to the harvest to see the also mortality rate, uh, feed conversion rate, uh, everything which is very important for the farmer. This is, uh, these are the results from the last year. So the fish which were vaccinated in two th 2017 also uh, vaccinated cage is uh, upper results and uh, down are the uh, results of non-vaccinated uh, cage you can see 
of the super size that uh, the first one vaccinated had didn't had these are losses in one year and uh, on the end of the production we have uh, some mortality but uh, um, uh, high density and the manipulation uh, in changing nets so we had uh, now on the end uh, some uh, losses in the second case uh, we had uh, bigger losses and uh, we had three outbreaks of Vibrio anguillarum. Sometimes when you are talking with the colleagues in other farms, they are saying that uh, if you vaccinate 50%, 60% or 80% of the fish on the farm, that you will have protection uh, in the other cages because the quantity of the Vibrio is uh, smaller and outbreaks are less often. But in our case, we uh, don't have this experience. We have only few cages uh, from this generation which are not vaccinated, which are staying and they are control cages for the vaccination. And on all of them, we had outbreaks of Vibrio anguillarum. So in our case, we think that you need, if you don't want to have Vibrio anguillarum outbreaks, that you need to vaccinate all the population on the farm. Uh, during the vaccination, it's important to follow up the performance of uh, vaccination. We are doing at, uh, we have, we will vaccinate this year 80 million of the sea bass. So it's a big quantity. We cannot check each of the cages, but we made some protocol that we will check each third cage on the performance and also this um, uh, we will check after 500 days minimum to see some sub do we have some side effects of the uh, vaccination on the during the vaccination we are checking the presence of vaccine and uh, precision of injection site so we are trying to check uh, is this everything on vaccination to be sure that uh, most of the fish is vaccinated and also that uh, the site is uh, correct. After 500 days, we are checking uh, the adhesions which are possible in the abdomen, also some pigmentation which can be sub side effects of the vaccine. This picture on the left is showing our results. So we can say that 85% of the uh, fish is, um, pre precision is good. But for the 15%, we have problems that uh, they are far away from the good point of the uh, injection. And uh, usually we have problem when we are changing people on the vaccination team, when we have bad weather, uh, when it's a vaccination on the sea, uh, not on the um, catchery, it's very difficult to have very calm weather. So sometimes we have problems which are related to the weather or the new people. But uh, for us, it's important to know uh, what is the problem for these um, things? Adhesion, they are very, oh, sorry. They are very fragile. You can see a little adhesion here, but uh, we don't think that it will be a problem during the life of the fish. And below is some pigmentation in the place where the vaccine was injected. Uh, finally, when we did uh, some analysis uh, of um, reduction of the use of antibiotics in the farms, we have uh, in the last seven years, we have uh, results like that. Uh, we analyze in the two ways. We analyze um, milligrams of antibiotics of active substance of antibiotics per produced fish, meaning fish which are harvested, 
that year. And other way to analysis is the quantity of doses which we give to uh, fish uh, by the produced fish. Why we did it in the two ways is uh, because when we put um, milligrams of active substances on the analysis, uh, we uh, saw that um, it's um, depending on the active substance which are using. So now we have in Croatia uh, two active substances on the market. We can use oxycotrexaclease or chlorphenicol. And uh, they, uh, in the doses, they have different quantity of the milligrams of active substances. So the right one analysis, which is show of showing the doses which we gave, is saying that uh, we are now going down with the quantity of antibiotics. Um, in 2017, we used oxytetraxiclin, so the peak was upper, because oxytetraxiclin has a little bit more active statistics uh, per doses. So we are very happy to uh, have only one treatment this year, and it was in the hatchery. So when you see here, it's a zero point something of the doses per produced fish. In the same um, period, we had steady growth of the production. So regarding antibiotics, uh, we are very happy to have this situation. A second um, cause of the problems in the farms are parasitical diseases. And uh, the main problem is with the monogenea parasites and with the Crustacea. Uh, the main problem in monogenea is Paricotyla chrysophry. In, in the Crustacea, it's uh, Ceratotoa estraides. They are causing the biggest losses uh, in our farms. Uh, what we can do with these losses, we can do monitoring of the parasites and we can do the treatment of the parasites. Sometimes treatments are useful, but sometimes we don't have uh, good results with them. So we are trying to find some uh, technical or husbandry method which will help to, to prevent these diseases. Uh, Ceratotoa astraides is um, a crustacean. It's a quite big parasite uh, living in the mouth of um, sea bass, sea bream, and even in the mega. And um, it um, provoked the losses in the fish up to 20 grams. After that, they can live in the buccal cavity of the fish. They are not provoking the losses, but fish uh, which have uh, parasites are, um, they have a uh, lower growth rate than the fish without the parasites. So we are trying to avoid that, and we are checking uh, our sites. You can see we have analyzed uh, uh, three sites which are near Zadar, which have um, the biggest problem with this uh, parasite. And um, uh, the prevalence of parasites is going down in two sites. In the third site, uh, it's going up, but uh, we didn't finish the vaccination on that farm, so we are um, expecting that the results will be maybe also that it's going down. Why I'm mentioning vaccination is because uh, on the vaccination, we are um, moving from the shores any fish which have a parasite. Parasite is quite big, so people who are making vaccination can look at the mouth and move the fish out of the production. And uh, this is a good because uh, we are now having uh, also the lower amount of the parasites on the farm. With the Lenatropus croeri, problem is that um, uh, it don't provoke the losses, but we have a problem uh, on the harvesting. We have a problem how to put this fish on the market because the parasite lives on the I will show you on the picture. Uh, parasite uh, lives on the gills, it's not here, and it's visible for the um, customer. So uh, we need to 
uncut the fish uh, and we decide because the problem was we made money monitoring uh, treatment was not possible and we decide the farm um, species so on this farm where we had a problem with the lenanthropus croeri we did bus but only sea bream because uh, this uh, parasite is host specific so we will not have a problem with the sea bream but uh, with the sea bus we have problem with the ceratotoa we can apply some treatments uh, but uh, the product which we are using is uh, already more than seven years in uh, use for our farm. So now we need to control each year the efficiency of this uh, product to be sure that uh, fish is not resistant to the product. You know that uh, fish parasites can make uh, some resistance on the product which we are using very often. So this is a result from last year. We don't have uh, fresh results. We will do it also this year where we are controlling the, the results of uh, treatment. Uh, the first colony is the treated cage and the second is the untreated. And uh, for the last year we had um, um, prevalence of ceratotoa much lower in the treated cage, uh, but what we also notice that after two months uh, after treatment, we again have a new parasite on the fish. So the treatment um, is efficient, but in the a situation when the fish is in contact with the environment and can catch parasites again, uh, we um, we are thinking that we need to improve some husbandry methods and to avoid uh, the new uh, parasites on the farm. Uh, with Paricotyla chrysophry, problem is on the sea bream. It um, is a parasite, gill parasite, uh, which uh, causes anemia uh, in the sea bream, which Anemia is strong and we can lose a lot of fish if we don't control this parasite. Um, treatment also can be done with a formalin, uh, but we are trying also with some um, uh, feed additives to avoid treatment with a formalin. Um, to be sure that we know what is going on the farms, we are doing um, regularly monitoring of abundance of the Paricotyla chrysophry, and we are checking also hematocrit to know how severe is the anemia in these uh, cages. So these are results of the few cages. Um, what we uh, noticed that uh, also uh, it's very hard to control the hematocrit of the fish because uh, different feed can also um, have a different quantity of iron. Nutritional disease was a bigger problem in the past. Now uh, it's not such big problem, but uh, cost of the feed is so high that we need also to control not just nutritional diseases, but feed itself. And we are having the feed trials on one platform which is only dedicated to the control of the feed. We are controlling the supplier and also we are controlling uh, the different types of the feed. So these are the results um, uh, from 2017. Uh, you can see that difference between producer are not so big in the feed conversion rate also with the growth rate. So we can say that uh, there is no dif big difference between the supplier and uh, it is the difference between the feed. So the lower um, table showing the feed with a better performance. 
with a better SCR and the better growth uh, rate. So we are now changing also the feed which we are using. Uh, after two years of vaccination and uh, monitoring of uh, parasitical disease on this way, we have a new uh, map of causes the mortality. And now you can see that uh, the bacterial diseases are lower than it was in the past and it's uh, efficiency of vaccination. On the other hand, uh, we have the higher mortality due to manipulation. And in this manipulation, we also put all the fish which, are, uh, which died uh, from stress because we sometimes have um, fish um, which are very afraid of wild animals like uh, dolphins and uh, wild fish and they have a sudden uh, death uh, also during the storms. So now we have the third part which we need to improve and we know that we did something with ba parasitical bacterial diseases but that we have uh, a big job to do about uh, manipulation and husbandry in the farm. So thank you for your attention and please have questions. If you have a question, I can give you an answer. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Uh, you have a question? Hello, <laughs> my name is Micaela, Micaela Bras. Um, I have a question. Do you think that there is, there is a real correlation between the an, an antibodies uh, types are and the real protection of the fish? The literature about this uh, is uh, very scarce. So I think that we don't have enough information from the science uh, what is the proper type of the antibody. But I think that uh, it could be in the future way to to analyze uh, efficiency of vaccines. Now it's not so. Did you but yes, but I think that in the future we need to go in that direction. Yeah, but did you see this on, on field? Uh, so if you monitor the always the, the titer of the antibody, uh, uh, ant this antibodies. Titer, this titer, uh, which which was comparison between the. Uh, the, uh, the supplier is not finished. So we have a tighter of the antibody, but we will wait for one year to see what will be the, the mortality rate in these uh, cases. So we will do, do the both things, all the production uh, information and plus uh, the antibody tighter. Thank you. ¿Tenéis alguna pregunta más si queréis las vamos aunando para, para el final? Pues ahora vamos con la siguiente ponente que es Ann Kinner. Ann Kinner eh, viene, de, viene de Escocia, ella eh, obtuvo su, es estadounidense, pero obtuvo su, obtuvo su PhD, su doctorado en la Universidad de San Andrews en Edimburgo y, y lo hizo estudiando eh, algo que a lo mejor, pues estos palos de ciencias del mar, ¿no? pues las, las medusitas, los sifonóforos y cositas de estas. Pero lo hizo estudiando cómo afectaba esto a los cultivos, a las granjas de salmón, que como os he dicho antes, están en medio del, del mar, en medio de, del medio natural. Luego estuvo trabajando también sobre eh, poblaciones de medusas en, en China 
y, y finalmente pues volvió a, a Escocia, donde estuvo trabajando para una empresa, Eurofarm Scotland, una empresa dedicada al asesoramiento en gestión sanitaria en, en granjas, y ahora pues es su, su, eh, su propia directora de, de empresa, asesorando en, en materia de, de manejo de la sanidad en granjas marinas en equilibrio con, con el medio ambiente. Nos lo cuenta ahora. Amigo. Hola y muchas gracias por escuchar. Uh, no voy a hablar español um, porque mi español no es suficiente para um, darte el toto. Perdone y gracias. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, and please, I am, um, as an English speaker from New England originally and now living in Scotland, I am very prone to speaking quite quickly. So if at any time I speak too quickly um, and you wish me to slow down, um, it probably means the translator would also like me to slow down, so please wave your arm, and I will endeavor to do so. Right, um, so I'm here to talk about plankton blooms and sea aquaculture, so I'm discussing the portion of um, zoo hygiene that um, Slavica um, introduced to you. And I need to give you some context for why I have Donald Rumsfeld here on my front slide. Um, if some of you are possibly too young to remember the Iraq war from 15 years ago, um, he famously said that there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, which is things that we we know we need to find out, but we don't know what they are yet. And there are unknown unknowns, which are things that we don't know about, but that are going to be problems, and we don't know that we need to know things about them. So, uh, cosas conocimos, <laughs> uh, etc. Um, so I will break this talk down by the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. So the known knowns first, here is our Donald looking quite um, proud of himself. By the way, I, I made this, this series of slides thinking um, it would amuse because uh, this is before uh, Donald. Well, when this Donald was the worst thing that could happen to the country. Um, so the definition of plankton, I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with this. Um, some of you may not. Plankton doesn't necessarily only mean small marine creatures that float. It just means marine creatures which are unable to swim against a current. So if it is in the mid-water and it's drifting, it counts as plankton. Um, we have, uh, oops, pardon, wrong button. That does include very large jellyfish. So we have two broad divisions, which are basically plant and animal. So phytoplankton, microalgae, they photosynthesize. Some of these species will produce toxins or other problems for salmon aquaculture or aquaculture in general, as we'll see. Um, some of them are zooplankton, which are the animal plankton which either graze on the phytoplankton or prey on each other. Um, and this does, as I say, include large species such as jellyfish. Oh, that was not, there we go. All right. Um, with phytoplankton, the primary concern that you will probably be familiar with is red tide. That's a blanket term given to many species. There are various um, phytoplankton genera which um, can produce a red tide. Um, they vary geographically, they'll vary by seasonality, and they tend to be somewhat rare. Um, there are times that they become a very big issue, such as currently in Florida. Um, I believe there is some evidence to show that they will become a bigger issue, but we, this is um, what we might say is a, a known unknown, the way that climate change and change in um, currents will affect red tide blooms. So we may see these problems cropping up in unexpected places, and at unexpected times in future. Whether that's going to happen more often, this is anybody's guess. Um, so these usually, re oh, excuse me, red tide usually refers, refers to poisonous dinoflagellates. Um, so they produce these toxins, they bioaccumulate in fish, and they can kill fish. Um, outright uh, fish kills can happen because of a dense bloom, um, but there's another less, um, less obvious problem, which we'll get to in, in just a moment. Uh, and that's the bioaccumulation that occurs in some species. This is a, big, this is a bigger problem in um, culture of um, mollusks than it is with finfish. So uh, these toxins don't affect most mollusk species, but they are um, lipid-soluble toxins which uh, are stored in the fatty tissues of mussels, clams, um, similar animals, um, and they become built up to the point that they become poisonous to predators which might eat them, and that includes us. Um, so there are four broad categories of that, including domoic acid, 
which causes amnesic selfish poisoning. It will affect your short-term memory. It's usually not, um, well, I've never heard of it being uh, fatal, but it is something to be avoided, obviously. Um, Ocadaic acid is not very enjoyable, but again, it probably will not kill you. Um, brevitoxins can cause um, neurotoxic effects, um, and saxitoxins are the ones that are the most um, poisonous to people. And all four of these things um, are generally tested for in most, um, most mollusk farming um, countries. Um, in Scotland, we have a testing system in which everyone either catching wild mollusks or farming mussels must submit a per certain percentage of their catch to the government for chemical testing of these toxins. Um, and if at any time the, the titer of these toxins rises above a certain level, the entire catch from that area must be taken off the market. Um, it's not a perfect system. Some things will still go through. But generally, if it does go through, it's the ocadaic acid production that will, will have affected people. So people will have a, a rough night, but you, we gener generally do not see death because of um, saxitoxin production in Scotland. The other type of plank phytoplankton blooms that are more relevant to fin fish include the irritant phyto phytoplankton blooms. So these are generally in the diatom group of, group of phytoplankton rather than the dinoflagellate group. Um, and these have siliceous spines and spicules um, that can be quite sharp. So these can become lodged in the gill tissues as the animal breathes um, and generally just rip them up. Um, so you can lead to irritations, um, lesions, secondary infections from bacteria or amoeba. Um, this is, this is a, actually a picture from um, some jellyfish damaged gills, but you, f you can see similar outcomes from uh, phytoplankton like this due to these spines, which are not flexible. And these are a problem in Scotland. They do not generally cause massive mortalities, but you do see some uh, limitation of growth and you do see some um, secondary infections that can really affect the entire farm that the farm must take some time to recover from. So on to jellyfish. Um, if I could quickly define, um, there are three key players in aquaculture for jellyfish. There are more types of jellyfish generally. Um, scyphozoans are the large ones that you would generally be able to recognize over the side of a boat or at the beach. Um, hydrozoans are typically much smaller. There are some areas of the world where there are larger species, but definitely in Scotland and mostly in the, in the Mediterranean, hydrozoans are quite small. You won't really necessarily see them unless you go looking for them. And siphonophores, which are a subgroup of hydrozoans that consist of a, a colony of hydrozoans which floats um, and drifts, and that can become broken up and pass through salmon cages. Um, what the thing that they all share in common are nematocysts. Um, which you might heard as stinging cells or um, stinging organelles. So there are subcellular structures. All of them are um, capable of firing. Some of them contain venom. And all of them will, in that firing, cause irritation to the gills. Um, Medusa, uh, jelly, both jellyfish and plankton, in general, um, it should be understood that this is a normal feature of biology. They're always going to be out there. If you, if you go to take a sample, of your water as at a sea farm, you will find these things. It's completely normal. The problem is when they form biomass aggregations that are far too large for the fish to handle. And those are what we're going to call blooms. Um, so the life cycle of a jellyfish is that you have um, an attached phase where they are, uh, they are sitting on the ben benthos. They are existing in either a colony or a solitary polyps. And those polyps don't move. They don't go anywhere. They simply sit there and eat and reproduce. Um, and all over winter, they typically develop the capacity to, to release their reproduced offspring. And in summer, we see the, those offspring swimming about. So this stage is completely asexual. This stage is their sexual stage in which the Medusa jellyfish goes off, swims, and can undergo recombination of its genes. Um, that recombination then results in a new colony beginning in a fresh location. So if you've ever seen a colony such as this. Um, I would zoom in on that for you, but um, if you wish, you can come and have a look. Um, this, is th this is what a colony of hydrozoans looks like. If you see a colony of scyphozoans, it's usually solitary polyps that live quite near each other. Um, and this is what they would look like in the summertime. Here is a picture of a gill exposed to a jellyfish bloom at very high densities. This was taken from a salmon farm in Scotland in 2013. 
um, there is a very, very large bloom of two combined jellyfish species, and some of the, the gill lamella tissue was, was eroded completely, as in this photo. Um, those can cause puncture trauma, as I stated, as the, as the nematocyst erupts, it can um, physically damage the gill. Um, they elicit an immune response from the structure of the nematocyst as the thread remains in the tissues. You'll el elicit quite a strong immune response. Um, you will also place. Um, in some cases that are as severe as this, um, some vets have reported to me that they will observe anemia in the fish as the, as the fish begin to bleed. So the biggest problem that we face with this in Scotland is, is that these are functionally invisible. Um, you can see this is a, a plankton toe sample. So this is collected with a net that concentrates the plankton into a small um, container so that you can view it in a microscope. Um, these um, copepod plankton are about 10 millimeters, 8 millimeters or so. This jellyfish here blends right into them. So you can see that in a sample during the summertime, it is very busy in the plankton. There's, there's a lot going on that's difficult to spot and it takes some skill to spot. Once you are able to, to see them and you get your eye practiced, eh, they're very easy to find and it's not a difficult task, but it is one that you must be aware is not simply, I look over the side, I don't see jellyfish, everything is fine. Um, these bars here are, uh, I think that is one, no, excuse me, two millimeter bars here. This is an Obelia jellyfish. So you can see that it is about one millimeter or even, even less than that, 0.75 um, millimeters across. So this animation may or may not work, but large species, um, you might imagine that salmon cages um, and bream cages will have large netting around them, so they will exclude large jellyfish. Unfortunately, that's not quite the case. Let's, oh, it's going to work. So we see currents will press the jellyfish up against the, um, the, the sea cages themselves. Their tissue will become broken up. And even though the nematocysts and the tentacles are away from the tissues of the jellyfish, they do not require nervous, central nervous control to fire. So at this point, just those tentacles alone can still damage the gills just through that macerated tissue. And we have upside down fish, so we know that they're dead. Very good. So that's how large jellyfish work. With smaller species, they simply go straight through, um, through the salmon net um, mesh and they can be inhaled directly across the gill structures. You also see in this, in this type of um, bloom, you also sometimes see evidence in the gut. And there's our upside down fish, excellent. Um, so some of these blooms are seasonal. Um, this here, this graph describes the seasonality of uh, both phytoplankton and zooplankton. Um, as, it were, as the season wears on, uh, you tend to have a very clear water during winter time because there's, there's not enough sunlight to begin a, a major photosynthetic development by the phytoplankton. As the sun starts to, to return in the springtime, you'll have a big spike in phytoplankton um, because the water is rich with nutrients and there's enough uh, light to work with. Um, and a spike in zooplankton tends to follow. Um, that tends to become a little bit more chaotic as the summer wears on, but um, as long as there is mixing in the water, that um, process can of often be very strongly sustained so that you have some stochasticity in when those blooms will appear. Um, and the worst time in Scotland seems to be um, August to October, so when there's still warm enough water for there to be um, a mix of problems for the, for the salmon, to be dealing with, and then also this ecological prompt for there to be blooms in the water um, around the fish. Um, so that's food web, web driven. Um, with the key jellyfish species in Scotland, it does appear that you need water for to be above about 12 degrees. Um, other species do occur. We do see very strong reproductive blooms of certain jellyfish species early in the year, but these do not appear to be associated with major problems at salmon farms. 
that may be due to the, the confluence of temperature and other agents that can cause that damage. So everyone will recognize this guy, I'm sure, as you are all Mediterranean and have probably been stung by him. Um, so Pelagia noctiluca is very um, occasionally a problem in Scotland, but it is becoming more and more a problem. So um, the outer islands have suffered, um, I think, probably about five or six blooms in the last five years or so of this species. So this species, it, it spends its entire life in the pelagic. It has no sessile attached phase, unlike other jellyfish. Um, so when this bloom occurs, it is not because the bloom arises locally. What happens is he will be reproducing offshore. There will be a current that causes it to aggregate in one location, and a very, very high density of this species will um, wash through the nets and cause major problems for the fish. Um, in one very memorable case in Northern Ireland about 10 years ago, the bloom was so dense that the cages were physically crushed and that the jellyfish um, had enough mass to push the cages together, um, reduce the flow through, and a number of salmon died of anoxia rather than envenoming, which was a very, very high density bloom. Less recognized, as I say, are the hydrozoans. So Diplurosoma typicum has become recognized as causing problems in Norway. Um, I expect, um, I have observed blooms of it in Scotland. There have been no reported associated mortalities, but that may be because we are not paying very much attention at the moment. Um, Phyllella quadrata is also associated with um, blooms causing damages, and that has a really interesting relationship with a known bacterium which Savitza mentioned, Tenacibacillum. So um, it is very strongly evidenced that it, it may even vector this bacterium, um, but we have not yet been able to reproduce this in the lab, only observed it in the wild. Um, the third species, the three, last three that I wish to, to mention to you are Obelia, Lysia blondina, and Mugiaia atlantica. And these are all um, very typical. You will see them in almost any sample that you take during the summer, but usually you see four or five of these individuals. If you start to see 200 of them, you should worry about the fish. So these tend to contribute to something that in salmon farms in Scotland is now being called complex gill disease and this is a rather new term. Um, it refers to the multi-causal gill diseases that we see typically toward the end of the summer, but sometimes year round. Um, because they are associated with amoeba, with bacteria, with um, damaging phytoplankton, it's very difficult to pin down the cause and therefore remove the, the stimulus to develop the disease. Um, and since both phytoplankton and jellyfish blooms are at their worst in the warmer months, um, this is a very good opportunity for the microbes to, um, to start causing mortality themselves. So once the, the gills are so compromised because of physical damage, because of phytoplankton or zooplankton blooms, um, it becomes much more difficult to treat for amoebae or other bacteria because the fish are already under stress. So sometimes the treatments th themselves can result in a massive loss. So you are in a catch-22, do we treat and kill all the fish or do we let all the fish be killed? So best to avoid this coming up. So let us move on to our known unknowns. And these are questions that we know we have and they're questions that uh, we know we need to answer with research soon. And here is Donald looking somewhat puzzled. Um, as I mentioned, hydrozoans and many phytoplankton are functionally invisible. They are not something that you can look over at the farm at the side of the boat and say there is a bloom happening. You must take a sample. This is, a, um, this is called a plankton toe. Um, and it's a long conical net with a catch at the end. You drag it through the water, through a certain distance of water, either laterally or vertically, um, and it concentrates the sample. Um, and that it will concentrate it according to the size of the plankton you wish to look at. So you must use two different nets of different mesh sizes to look at phytoplankton and zooplankton. They cannot be combined because the sizes are so wildly different that you will not be able to glean the necessary information. Then you have to observe them with a microscope. For zooplankton, you must use a, a stereo zoom microscope with less, um, less um, uh, amplification. If you're, using, if you're looking for phytoplankton, it's best to use a stage clip mounted microfo microscope, microphone. Um, but both 
require the skills to recognize the, the species in question and to parse through a sample to make sure that you've made a, a representative observation. Without doing those skills, there is presently no way to rapidly see whether there is a bloom taking place at any given site. So when do blooms occur? We don't know that either. Um, some stimuli that folk have suggested include weather, um, are there big waves being whipped up that can produce, that can stimulate a colony to begin producing jellyfish? That seems like a strong possibility. One species, but not a Medusa producing species. With the species we are, um, is it runoff? Um, we have a lot of rain in Scotland. Uh, rain can wash a certain uh, chemical stimulus into the stimulus. If the salinity makes a very strong change, does this cause this re um, too much food, not enough food? Are you being eaten by a predator, all of these things may be stimuli for reproduction to occur, but none of them have been demonstrated. Um, the confounding factor we have in Scotland um, is that some species, as with Pag Pelagia nautiluca, we can say that we will see it coming in from offshore. So you can see with that that there is a current happening. You can see that in the current there are this um, aggregation of jellyfish. And as it moves in, at least you can know a little bit in advance this is coming. Even if there is no, nothing useful you can do, at least you can be a little prepared. With the smaller species, a surprising finding is that they do not do this at all. They are produced locally. So here is the very complex coastline of Scotland. You can see all of these fjords, which we call here sea lochs, um, like lakes, but Scottish. Um, so each sea loch is essentially its own separate environment. So if we monitor in this sea loch, and we monitor in this sea loch very nearby, completely different dynamics. So this graph shows the array, the array of species and the number of them that you will find in these sea lochs at the same time. These are samplings from the same date. They have nothing to do with each other. So that, as you might imagine, rules out the moon controlling it, because the moon would operate just the same on both sites. It will rule out calendar cycles, because that would, again, also be the same on both sites. So the stimulus, no one knows. This must be researched. Um, are some sites more at risk than others? Between these four sites, we found that these two sites that are slightly more inland in sea lochs, which are slightly up shore, um, less pelagic influence to these sea lochs. Um, they are less affected by jellyfish. The, the um, populations measured in those were consistently lower by a factor of 10. At these sites, more ocean facing, more subject to pelagic influence. Um, even though they were undergoing local production of jellyfish, they were very prone to blooms and very damaging blooms, which resulted in serious mortalities. So, however, this is based on four sites. Does this hold true for, for every site in Scotland? Does every hold, site, uh, hold true for every site in the Mediterranean? We will need to find this out as well. Um, is there a spatial distribution question? So um, in Scotland, these skirts, they are called. There will be skirts around the outside of a sea pen to try and block the inflow of sea lice. Um, sometimes they don't work so well, and instead they block the outflow of sea lice, but we are trying. Um, so in these sea lice skirts, Let's say the jellyfish like to aggregate in the top of the water column. Does that mean these skirts would be effective for jellyfish? This is another good thing that we should be researching. We should be sampling. We should test in and out. Um, does location within the sea loch have any effect? If you are farther up the sea loch, fewer jellyfish? Or are there more jellyfish because they prefer fresher water? Or if you are at the mouth of the sea loch, is that the most dangerous place to place your cages? This would be good information to be able to give to um, planning. Um, so that when we decide where to place a sea farm, um, it can be done in the safest way possible so that the welfare of the fish is maximized. Um, again, because blooms are invisible, we do not see them as they are occurring. Because they are short-lived, temporarily, we tend not to see them when we notice the problem. So when the fish begin to show signs of inflamed gills, when the fish start um, showing high mortalities, or when the fish begin to have behaviors that are abnormal. Usually, the jellyfish bloom is gone. 
So we look for the reason that this is happening and we cannot find a reason. So if this is a major contributing factor behind complex gill disease, we're underestimating because we do not see when the blooms occur. So the current mitigation strategies that we have are theoretical. We do not have any effective, proven, evidence-based mitigation strategies. Um, we've suggested bubble netting. So with larger jellyfish, they can become entrained in the bubbles. You can place a hose around, um, an air hose around the base of the cage. It can push bubbles up toward the top and a larger jellyfish can get full of those bubbles and kind of flip over and get stuck at the top of the water. Um, that's not a complete solution, but if you combine that with a sea lice um, skirt, sometimes that effect of the jellyfish breaking up and flowing through the cages can be diminished. Does it work? We have no evidence. With the smaller species, this is unlikely to work at all. The bubbles will not generally fill up the bell of the medusa because the animal is so very small. So it's likely that there may be some disruption of nematocysts in smaller jellyfish, which would mean that by the time the animal is pushed through the cage, it's reduced in the harm that it can cause. But again, also not proven. Um, the next idea that, that seems to be the most supported is to stop feeding while there is a bloom ongoing. And that holds for both phytoplankton and jellyfish. Um, since the, the two, um, since feeding would, would um, mean that the animals taking uh, the fish are taking in more plankton as they as they move around and they have less impetus to try and behaviorally avoid the bloom um, feeding can increase the amount of exposure that they suffer so if there is a bloom ongoing it's best to minimize the stress and avoid feeding the fish until it has passed and because they are short-lived that is not entirely unreasonable to do um, and finally when the fish are already under stress we should probably avoid stressing them further. So if there are um, handling scheduled, if there are revaccinations, if there are um, immersion treatments or any, any other handling of the fish at, at a sea farm um, on, the, on the calendar for a day that a bloom appears, even if it costs money, it is best to strike it out and reschedule it. Um, one major treatment for amoebic gill disease is presently to uh, give freshwater baths on a well boat. So fish are basically hoovered out of the um, out of the sea into a, into a, a boat filled with um, large pools, and the pools in this case are filled with fresh water from a lake, um, and that can cause amoebae in the gills to fall off. So that's a pretty good strategy if you have the suspicion that a jellyfish attack could then um, permit fresh water. Excuse me, could then permit amoebic infections. So that would be a case-by-case -case basis to assess whether that handling is worth risking the stress to the fish. But that may be a good intervention to take if, there's, if there is reason to believe that an amoebic gill disease could, could go through the farm. And let's go on to unknown unknowns. These are the questions that we have about um, what's coming up in jellyfish as the climate changes, as the um, fish farm um, effort increases, what's going to happen. These are things that are blue sky questions that we know we need answers to and we have none. And our Donald here looks very stressed as he speaks to Congress. So we have some very basic biology questions to look at first. Um, I have named six or seven species to you that we know cause problems in aquaculture. Um, 90 more species have not even been studied. And in the case of one of the species that we know is a problem, this is Lysia blondina. There are no literature published papers peer reviewed that have anything describing its life cycle, what its hydrid stage looks like, whether it even has an attached stage, nothing. We know absolutely nothing about it. And yet, here we are. No one at present is regularly collecting or recording their samples of jellyfish. Um, the only effort I know of that is being currently undertaken in the world for that is happening in Italy, um, and it is a girl finishing her PhD. When she leaves, possibly no one. So no one is recording a data set for this issue. We don't know how much the fish can tolerate. So if you think back to those mitigation strategies I discussed a minute ago, um, when do you use them? How big does the bloom have to be before you become concerned? 
if you see a spike in population, is it worth worrying about? How big is that spike? How big does something have to be before you call it a spike? Um, what's a worrying bloom versus what's not a worrying bloom? So then maybe if you have a not so worrying bloom, does it, if you expose the fish to it for long enough, will that cause the same effect? Again, we don't know this. When's the best time to treat the fish if you realize that a bloom has happened? Is there a, a, a sweet time, a window, in which you can apply a treatment to minimize the, the harmful outcomes? No evidence basis for this whatsoever. Are there confounding factors that we should worry about? So as I mentioned, we have a multiplankton situation. If we have a co-bloom of multiple jellyfish species, multiple phytoplankton species that are harmful, um, amoebic gill disease and um, bacterial diseases, um, what are, what are, what's that mix going to do to the fish? Um, are different fish affected in other ways? So if you have recently transferred smolts, will they be more susceptible or perhaps less susceptible to these sorts of blooms? Um, do the temperature and salinity appear to have an effect? Or is that only because in warm temperatures there's simply more pathogens. We also don't know this. And then there's the question of venom toxins, which I will come back and speak to you at length about. Um, jellyfish have what we would class as a predatory venom. Um, that is a, a mix of protein toxins which are intended for capturing, subduing, and digesting prey. And the digestion is something that really shows up in the gills. Um, so the digestive enzymes such as lipases and proteases can cause a lot of damage even besides the physical damage caused by the nematocysts um, as they sting. Um, and that has the potential to cause systemic effects to the fish as well as local effects. So some jellyfish, not aquaculture relevant, can cause major systemic effects as we know um, in terms of human health. But are there aquaculture relevant effects that cause systemic in, in fish? Again, we don't know this. Um, the endogenous re immune response of a fish can be um, strong and cannot always be good. Um, there are responses to the venom proteins and then the structural proteins and structural materials of a, of a nematocyst thread that remains in the tissue after a, um, a sting has occurred um, that can take up to two weeks to break down. So during that time, that structure is being infiltrated um, with white cells to to begin to work on it, that it must itself be digested um, by the fish. And during that time, um, that tissue will be compromised and will not be functioning as it's intended. And then there's the interaction with antiparasitics. So one thing that we are uh, three not going to talk about today is sea lice, um, as um, it's a very strong problem, it's a very well-known problem, and I rather suspect that all of you will hear at length about sea lice um, during the remainder of your course. But in Scotland, sea lice is the most recognized problem to um, sea-caged salmon. And no one ever thought to themselves, let's see what the sea lice treatment does to salmon. We can see that it kills lice, but what does it do to salmon? So recently, um, a vet in Scotland studies the effects of a treatment called azimethifos on, um, on, on, on gills. So he's taken some from trout, from sea trout, and some from salmon. These pictures are from sea trout. Um, on normal, I did not include a normal gill histology slide here, I should have done, but a normal um, histo of uh, a, a lamella looks more similar to this, possibly a, li a little bit more elongate in, in these lamellae, but Immediately following a treatment with the pesticide, this is what the, the gill looks like. And if that's what the pesticide is doing to the gill under a, a normal treatment with healthy fish, imagine what that treatment is going to do to a fish that has recently suffered a bloom. Um, so can fish tolerate a bloom and this treatment? I'm, I don't think they can. I think if the bloom has been sufficiently damaging, this is probably um, an impetus for major mortalities. Um, and those mortalities presently, because we are not looking for blooms, they are presently chalked up to the, um, the um, antiparasitic agent alone. So it would be, as I say before, with regards to handling, it would be wise to schedule treatment strategically so as to avoid um, periods of stress after a bloom has passed. And then the wild, another wild card is what happens to cleaner fish? So there is major effort in Scotland now to replace antiparasitic agents with cleaner fish. So wrasse and lumpfish to um, 
prey on the, the sea lice themselves and pick them off with salmon. It seems to be working reasonably well, so we are trying to reduce the amount of um, antiparasitic chemicals that we use. Um, but now that means we have polycultural cages. So are they affected by blooms? Do we need to worry about them? We have n no idea at present. And then the big bugbear that all of us must be thinking about um, as you are all young people looking ahead to a world that is under um, a massive change coming on the horizon, which is climate change. So with jellyfish, um, a very common um, pattern in many, many species is that in a cold winter, you will not see any jellyfish during the winter as per normal, but during that cold winter, they will be stimulated to produce many offspring, many more offspring than if they were small, or than, it, than if it were warm, excuse me. Um, and then, so the summer, following a particularly cold winter, you will see massive aggregations of jellyfish. Um, meanwhile, in a warmer winter, instead of reproducing sexually to produce medusae that can go and swim, they will reproduce asexually by growing the colony laterally. So they will develop a larger potential for the next year. So if there are not good controls on this population of um, predators which will graze them, which will re you know, reduce their population, then this can become um, you know, a, an increasing population as time goes on. So if we have a pattern that is occurring in Scotland now, in which we have colder winters followed by hotter summers, we may be looking at much greater magnitudes of blooms that occur. So our solution is research, and I've replaced Donald Rumsfeld here with an excellent quote by our formerly the worst president ever, um, in which he said, rarely is the question asked, is our children learning? Which, if you don't speak English, um, I mean, you do speak English, I'm sure most of you, but um, I need to clarify that that is terrible grammar. So this is speaking English the way I might speak Spanish. He was the president. Anyway, so is our children learning? Let us do some research. So the basic approach is to sample. So I show you that plankton toe, the net, the conical net that you drag through the water, that's the first line of defense. What's happening? We go look there. So we take a sample, we examine the sample, and this is a system that's under um, being in place in many Scottish farms for phytoplankton, but not for uh, zooplankton and jellyfish. So this is our stoplight system. So the sample is drawn, the sample is exa examined on site, so you do, do not need a specific expert with PhD to find this out. You simply need someone who can recognize a sample in the microscope. So they do a quick estimate of what's in the sample, and they say, okay, that has exceeded today's threshold. We, we must not feed the fish and we must not handle the fish for a set period of time. After that set period of time, we examine the water again. Everything's okay now. And we go back to green light system or they examine the, s the sample and there's a worrying level, or they examine the sample and there's nothing happening, the day proceeds as normal. So this is a, this is a good idea um, to go with. It's very simple, it's very cheap, and it requires minimal skills acquisition and minimal labor. Um, the best way to then enhance that approach is not simply to do that system, but to write that system down. So as you take those counts and you say, today's a good day or today's a bad day, you write down what your numbers from every day was. And this way, you, you develop a data set, and you develop a data set for every site that does this monitoring. And that can help us look for local trends, such as at this site, the, the population does this, and at this site, it does this. Um, it can, we can link it to weather patterns, we can link it to hydrodynamic current patterns, and we can look at biotic features that differ between sites. Um, and on a larger scale, so in Scotland for the entire nation or for the entire nation of Norway, we can look at um, the differences between sites and then develop informed models that can assess the risks for each site. There are some high-tech options, and these are um, sexy. They're very, they're, they're darling to certain um, aspects of research but they are not yet very effective. So eDNA is touted as the next big thing, and this means environmental DNA, which has been shed to the environment. Sometimes it means um, acellular DNA, which is, which is 
has been completely removed from cells, or it can mean cells that have been shed and are floating, but you can still identify the animal where they came from. Um, and this can be detected from a water sample um, and could also, given the density of it, can provide you a semi-quantitative uh, warning of what's happening in the water. Um, and if you can develop yourself a good um, semi-automated PCR, you can use it in such a way that your uh, human involvement in the task is minimal. However, the human involvement in this task, in setting this up, given the equipment that is required, it's not very different from the equipment required to take a, a plankton so and toe and look at it under a microscope. That's also a lot cheaper. So this sounds great. This is, you know, Jurassic Park movie. It sounds amazing. But, but it's, it's still under development. You cannot buy this anywhere right now. So it is not a present solution. It's very expensive. And it doesn't really save you that much time. So right now. And then here's the really high-tech expensive option that everyone wants to go with. Um, microscope that you essentially park in a buoy somewhere out to sea. So this is the Flow Cytobot made by a company in Massachusetts. Stream of water takes a picture of every organism that passes, and you get to, and it has a software that will recognize that organism, count it up, and send you a data set on your computer via satellite. Sounds amazing. They cost sixty thousand dollars a pop. I don't think that with forty salmon sites in one company in Scotland that they will be particularly enthusiastic about buying these. Um, so maybe not. If this were something that we could say, well, we only need three because we have figured out which sites will predict all the other sites, maybe we can come back to talk about the flow site about. But without knowing those sites so that we can deploy this strategically so that it is economical, I don't think this is the future either. And then we have satellite imaging. If you don't recognize her, she's another villain from America. Um, and does anyone remember I can see Russia from my house? No? Oh, well. She, she was formerly the governor of Alaska. And uh, her qualification to be the vice president was that Alaska is right next to Russia. So um, if she can see Russia from her house, the next question is, why can't we see jellyfish from space? So I get asked this a lot. Why don't we just use satellite monitoring? Satellites are great. We can spy on people. We can see their license plates. Well, has anyone been to Scotland? No one? That's because the weather here is so amazing. It's rubbish in Scotland. Um, there are a lot of clouds. And if you get a day when there are clouds and it doesn't rain, that was a really good day. Um, so I do not yet know of a satellite that can see through clouds. So if your technological careers help you to invent one, then more is the best. We will apply you to the salmon farms and move on from there. However, presently in Scotland, we can't see crap <laughs> through, the, through the clouds. It just doesn't work. The other problem is that um, satellites are very good at viewing open ocean. So let's say for, for, for the sake of argument that the weather in Scotland has been magically cleared and it's perfect forever. Satellites suffer from reflectance issues. So you must adjust the setting on, on each photograph it takes to be able to represent the surfaces that you want to view. If you are viewing an all land surface, that's fine. You can change the reflectance um, absorbance settings to see that land. If you want to see all sea, that's also fine. You can change it to, to view open sea only. However, if you have a situation where the land edge and the sea edge are quite close, then the land edge will reflect far more than the sea. So for a period into the sea, there will be uh, too much reflectance from the land and completely absor um, obscure your vision of the sea surface. So with this complex coastline of Scotland, you can see that there's a lot of crenellated coastline where um, there, you know, there are in embayments and sea locks and fjords. And all of these places are invisible to satellites because there is so much land around them. So effectively, even if the weather were amazing, we just we can't see in that with a satellite. You have to be on the ground to look at it. So um, that's why we can't use satellites to look at jellyfish. It, they're useful for looking offshore, 
So for phytoplankton, this is the exception, for phytoplankton that are produced offshore and which blow in, looking at the sea surface chlorophyll is useful to predict when there will be a certain type of red tide. So that's the exception. That is presently being conducted by um, Sophos in, in Plymouth. And that information is sold to salmon farms in Scotland with a subscription, and it's a very effective system. But it cannot be applied to other forms of blooms. So that's what I've just explained. Um, in the oops, excuse me, in these broad areas, in these broad areas of, of open water, you can see sat from the satellite. In these coastal sea lock areas, those are going to be opaque to the satellite's viewing. Um, so if blooms are locally specific, visualizing the open ocean nearby will not tell you anything relevant to what's happening at the salmon farm inside the embayment or loch. Oceanographic modeling is the next goal, um, but um, like any data set, you need to feed it data. If you feed it garbage data, you will not get anything meaningful out of it. So ideally, with a very good data set, you could develop enough predictive power to have almost a, a jellyfish and phytoplankton forecast. So what's, what is your prediction for the next 10 days? Can we be prepared for it? But we, without collecting that data set, as we discussed, this is not something that we can reasonably expect in the near future. So um, this would require a na nationwide effort to implement. So the verdict, as far as I'm concerned with avoidance research, is that you start here. You start simple, and you look at these eDNA surveillance, the flow cytobot, and the oceanographic modeling as being the wave of the future, because you must give the information um, to those technologies as ground truthing data. And this is something that if we wanted to, we could do it tomorrow. So some very blue sky discussions in terms of, of phytoplankton and jellyfish blooms have to do with treating the symptoms that arise from being exposed to a bloom. So do we know whether the primary sting effects are due to physical injury or toxins? Are these treatable and preventable? Um, if they are, which ones do we treat and how do we treat it? And how do we square that with secondary infection? So this has a lot of, of potential for, um, for both um, development and for mitigating uh, the effects of a bloom. But it's very blue sky. So I would say at best, this would be 10, 15 years down the road in terms of research. Um, and I will go into why that is in my second lecture about how to, um, how to examine venom. Um, almost near the end. Post-bloom diagnostics are another thing that we don't have. We don't have a good way of saying a bloom has come through. Um, so recently, um, human applied and veterinary applied blood chemistry analysis um, that is automated for a certain number of um, endpoints um, has recently been developed and applied for aquaculture for fin fish. So um, dealing with fish blood can be quite difficult um, in terms of an automated system because it, it will clot differently and it will separate out differently. It won't um, behave in the way that you expect from human blood. Um, so a recent project in Scotland uh, by a chap from Greece found that um, he could adjust the chemistry of the automated machine to show um, the outcomes in the blood. So if there are biomarkers which are relevant to um, a phytoplankton bloom or a jellyfish bloom, perhaps we can find out what they are and we could use that to uh, develop some diagnostics for knowing what's happened to the fish. So this is a cost-benefit analysis to think about. This is the density of, the, of a pelagia bloom that occurred in Scotland. It took out the farm, essentially. That was several million pounds worth of fish lost. Um, so if the, if the industry at present is considering whether to adopt mitigation factors, this is the outcome of blooms that we are needing to consider against the cost of research. And it is on us to do that research. Um, as industry members and as innovators of the future, you will contribute to that. Questions? No record on Thank you. Um.
Eh, creo que eh, si hay alguna pregunta rápida, vamos un poco apretados de tiempo. Eh, como esta tarde va a estar ella también, si alguien tiene interés, eh, podríamos hacer la, la pregunta esta tarde. ¿Alguna cuestión? Pues vamos con la última ponente. Thank you, Juan. Bueno, nuestra última ponente de esta mañana es Rosa Medino. Eh, ella viene de la empresa IPRA. Eh, se dedican sobre todo a la prevención mediante vacunas, tanto en ganadería terrestre como, como en acuicultura, y, y son de los bien posicionados, y en, no solo en España, sino, sino en Europa. Ella también ha trabajado, eh, ha hecho, y es de lo que nos va a hablar, por, eh, las granjas marinas de salmón pues nos llevan la delantera, la experiencia y por tanto de ahí tenemos que aprender. Nos va a hablar sobre su salmón. Gracias, Rosa. Hola, buenos días. Eh, bueno, voy a ir un poco rápido porque nos hemos quedado sin mucho tiempo. Y bueno, solamente el título, que sepáis que está en castellano, el resto de la, de la presentación está en inglés, pero bueno, voy a hacerla en castellano. Mi objetivo de la presentación, bueno, es bastante general y yo me iría contenta con que tengáis una idea a gran escala, bueno, de lo que es toda la gestión del salmón en producción y, y un poco de salud, entonces voy a darlo muy eh, a grandes rasgos. Eh, yo, por ejemplo, cuando salí también de mi máster de acuicultura, pues al final cuando vas a, al sitio real eh, te das cuenta de, bueno, de que te faltaban muchita, muchas cosas eh, por saber <risa> o que no has podido ver durante el máster o la carrera. Luego me gustaría hablar un poquito pues, de la salud de los peces y el bienestar animal, eh, por qué los peces eh, están vacunados, por qué se vacunan y cómo se vacunan. Y mientras tanto, pues a lo mejor eh, os dais cuenta de lo increíbles que son los salmones, eh, lo, el reto que supone eh, la industria acuícola o la salmonicultura, por ejemplo, que tenemos dos fases, la de agua dulce y la de agua salada, y luego, bueno, pues podéis también tener algún conocimiento y alguna curiosidad para ganar quesitos verdes en un trivia. Eh, bueno, IPRA es una empresa de prevención animal. Trabajamos sobre todo con, bueno, empezó trabajando con eh, animales terrestres y poco a poco nos hemos metido en el mundo de los peces, pero hemos estado más especializados en la, en, en la, en la industria mediterránea, trabajando con dorada lubina, rodaballo y trucha. No tenemos todavía productos para, para salmones, vacunas para salmones, pero estamos trabajando en ello. Eh, me gustaría saber qué sabéis sobre los salmones y qué sabéis sobre el salmón que coméis. ¿Reconocéis alguna, cuál creéis de todas las especies que coméis? Bueno, pues ninguna, porque todos son salmones pacíficos, son cinco especies de salmones pacíficos, son los que típicos que veis en los documentales, que se comen los osos gris.